So WWDC happened and Apple has blessed us with yet another one of their brand new inventions, AI. And by AI, we mean Apple intelligence because in classic Apple fashion, they just will not use a pre-existing tech term, one that's been out for decades. They take artificial intelligence, tweak it and repackage it to us as Apple intelligence. But I would say that this time around, they actually have something that's pretty unique. I think that this product is arguably the best consumer AI we've seen on the market. And I would also go as far as to say is that I don't think other companies can easily pull off something quite like this. So the first question you might have is what is Apple intelligence? And I guess the best way to describe it is it's an AI system that lives on any kind of computing product from Apple, a new computing product from Apple. So an iPhone, a tablet, a Mac. And the purpose of this AI system is just there to elevate the whole user experience when it comes to communications and work. And there are three main areas that they're integrating this Apple intelligence. The first is with text, so the generation and understanding of text. The second is with image generation. And then the third is with Siri. It's been a completely overhauled system, badly needed. Uh, and Siri is now at the point where I used to think it was like the worst digital assistant on the planet. And now it's probably gonna be the best. Okay, let's start off with that first one, text. So with Apple intelligence, your devices can look at text and it can proofread it, rewrite it, or summarize it. And it can obviously work with first party apps like mail or notes, but it also works with third party apps. And this can be super useful. Like you can imagine like proofreading something for spelling or grammar. And they have examples of rewriting paragraphs in a different tone or like as a poem. And they also had examples where they summarized big walls of text into something more concise. But none of this is like groundbreaking innovation, right? We've seen most of this kind of tech before, but you'll see in a second, all of this ties into a much larger picture. Uh, now, the second thing that they showcased was image generation. Now, they've broken it into like two components. The first is Genmojis, the second is Image Playground. So first, Genmojis, it's their generated emoji. So they basically use these text prompts and profile photos if you want to be able to create these personalized emojis. And you can use them in messages or stickers and reactions and they look fun, like they're a little cheesy, but I think my kids, my family, they're just gonna love these things. And it's very on brand for Apple. Like the idea of using generative AI to create these custom emojis, it's perfect for the brand. Uh, now the second thing is a little bit more interesting to me. So it's image generation that they call image playground. And the idea here is that users are able to create images from scratch. And you only get a few art styles to choose from. Uh, you can use existing photos to help with the text prompt, but it's all done on device. All of that generative AI is just happening right on the chip of whatever phone, tablet, or computer that you're using. And you can use these generated images in messages to send to people, or you can use it in your workflow. So if you have a project that you're working on or some kind of document that you're working with, you can pull up the image playground tool and it'll contextually identify the words around the area that you're working on and create an image for you based on that context. Now, some of the image playground demos they did didn't look great to me. Like they had an example of someone sending a birthday wish with one of these generated images and it just felt really gross to me. Like the image itself seemed dated as if it came from a really old iteration of this kind of tech. Uh, it just looks not great, but also the idea of getting one of these low effort images as a birthday wish, I don't know. It just feels like this would get stale very quickly if people use it too much. Uh, but if you'll notice, the images that were produced with this image playground, none of them were really photorealistic. Like if you compare it to something that Midjourney would generate, these Apple intelligence photos seem much more playful, but also just lower quality. I think part of it is that Apple doesn't want photorealism here. I think they wanted something that's meant to be more playful and fun, almost like a toy. But I also don't think that the hardware, if they're doing this all on device, I don't think the hardware could even handle that right now. Uh, now the third way that they've integrated Apple intelligence into this whole Apple ecosystem is with Siri. So this new Siri runs an LLM that is local on device, and it can now perform actions based on context from emails and messages. Like it can add an event into a calendar or it can make reservations or it can give you information about an appointment or a flight that you had booked. Like you can take a conversation that you had previously and then reference it with some data from the maps app or like the photos app, and then it can draw a conclusion and then act on that conclusion. It can perform an action based on all of that context. It is so much better than anything we've seen before from Siri. And this is, I think, the way that we've imagined AI assistants to be, like this weirdly intelligent tool. Now, the way that it works is that right now, Siri will try to perform all of these requests 
on device. Like if you ask it to do something, it'll do its best to handle it locally on device. But you're gonna run into limitations. These are LLMs you're dealing with, right? Large language models, keyword being large, and on a device with eight gigs of RAM, it can only be so large before it doesn't even run on these systems. That is the cutoff, by the way. These systems need eight gigs of RAM to be able to pull off Apple intelligence right now. So if the system thinks that a particular request is too complex to handle on device, it will send that request out to the cloud where there are servers with much stronger compute power, and then it'll send the result back to the phone. But the third variant is that if Siri thinks that the question is better suited to chat GPT, like if you're asking it a more generative question or a more creative question, like the example they gave was like, if you have a bunch of ingredients, you know, you got this fish and this vegetable and you want a recipe for it, chat GPT is really good at that type of stuff. So it will then prompt you and say, hey, chat GPT is really good for this type of question. Do you mind if we send it over to them? And if you want to, you can get chat GPT to handle that request and it'll send you that answer. Now, as I was watching the keynote, I was obviously impressed with what they're showcasing with Apple intelligence, but there's another part of me that realized the best version of this consumer AI type product is gonna come from a company that has full access to your digital life, like your emails and your messages. Like, and so I think the only companies that could pull off a product like this are gonna be maybe Microsoft, but Google and Apple. And I would say that Microsoft doesn't have a real shot here to, to be that like all encompassing product because they don't make phones anymore. And, and I think if you're gonna create a product like this, it has to be on a phone. You know what I'm saying? Like it has to be such a pervasive and, and ubiquitous part of society that if you don't have a phone, you can't be the company that just nails it, okay? So I would say Microsoft is out. But then if you look at Google, I mean, they have access to the most phones, right? They have a huge product stack with all the Gmail and Google Docs. Everybody uses that stuff. It's awesome. But could they pull it off? Could they create an LLM that ties in their whole product stack? I think they could, but the biggest thing is privacy because we're not dealing with like regular like your browsing habits here. You're dealing with like the, again, the best version of companion AI like this is something that has access to the, your most personal stuff and to entrust Google with it. That's, that's something I think a lot of people would be uncomfortable with because it's Google and they are absolutely in the business of using your data. Now, some people just don't care about this stuff. That's fine. But I think a lot of people would be concerned if they knew that Apple or Google or Microsoft was just slurping up your user data while you were using their AI tools. Now, the way that Apple has approached this whole thing about privacy is pretty unique. It's, I think, the biggest differentiating factor from what Apple intelligence is compared to anything else we've seen on the market before. Okay, so Apple has usually has had a pretty good stance about privacy. They do their best to try to keep uh, user data and personal information private. They, they seem to at least. Now, when it comes to AI of this caliber, like contextual AI, you need some pretty sensitive information, or it could be sensitive, right? You're dealing with emails, you're dealing with messages that are like, those are your messages. And to send it out to the cloud, there's a concern. Because remember, like I showed before, when Apple intelligence thinks a request is too complex to handle on device, it sends it to the cloud. And that's when you have the risk of privacy loss. Now, the way that Apple has done this is really interesting. They are so hardcore about this whole privacy thing when it comes to this type of data. They built their own secure data centers for this cloud element of Apple intelligence, and they call it private cloud compute. Uh, and their process seems super hardcore. Like even when the server hardware is being made, they take these high res photos and then at the data centers, it gets validated by a third party before they actually put the hardware in and then seal it up. And there's like a crazy number of steps they're doing to ensure that the data that gets sent to the cloud stays secure. And also once that request has been fulfilled, they say that they've, they nuke the data completely and nothing gets retained. Now, I don't know how much of this is, you know, for fact, these are, very big claims that they're making, but it's also seemingly auditable. Like the software that they're using is publicly auditable. It's impressive stuff. And then the other thoughts that come into my mind are like, I cannot imagine Microsoft and or Google doing something like this. Like, I feel like the, the whole context of privacy and securing user data and personal information and like keeping it, like there's no way. I feel like they just, they just don't care enough about that stuff as companies to put in the resources that this required from Apple intelligence. Uh, okay, there you have it. I think that this product from Apple, their uh, consumer AI product is by far the best one in the market. Not because of its like top end capabilities. It's, 
it is somewhat limited, but it's just how they integrated all this stuff into their hardware, into this bizarrely tight, uncomfortably tight ecosystem. It just works so well for this type of product. Okay, there you have it. Those are my thoughts on Apple Intelligence.